Welcome everyone to another episode of the Creepy Fox Scary Stories Podcast. We got another good one for y'all today, as we continue our coverage on scary let's not meet stories that have been shared by internet users such as yourselves who are listening today. If this is the first time you're joining us, then make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell as we upload some of the best true crime and scary stories content that you're ever going to hear on YouTube. Also, if you yourself have a scary story that you'd like to share for a future episode, then make sure to send it in using the user submissions email on screen. That's tcfnarrations at gmail.com. But with all those formalities out of the way, sit back and relax as we take you on a deep dive through these scary let's not meet stories. Enjoy. Hi everyone, this happened about a year ago and it's still pretty freaky. For context, my friend and I are both 22 years old and female. My friend Anna and I were bored one weekend and decided to go to a popular beach to take some pictures and just to mess around. So we took pictures and had a really lovely day. Then on the way back we were starving so we decided to stop at McDonald's in the beach town. This town is like really really famous and it's nice too. All the celebrities live there, and it's beautiful. There's also a super famous restaurant, which is right off the highway on the beach, and it's known for celebrities and rich people going there. This McDonald's was directly across the street from said restaurant. Since so many famous people go to this restaurant, and it's on a pretty busy road, most of them have drivers that take them, usually in big black escalades. The drivers would usually hang out in the parking lot of that McDonald's, meanwhile their bosses ate across the street. Anna and I didn't know this at the time, we just wanted our McFlurries. So we go to the McDonald's, and right when we get out of the car, she starts to act really weird. She triple checks that the car doors are locked, and then grabs her fancy camera to bring inside. I ask her what's going on, and she says there's a group of guys. The drivers, standing in front of the McDonald's smoking and staring at us, it was giving her the creeps. I'm a pretty chill and trusting person, so I don't really think much of it. It is a busy place after all in a super nice town. I'm not too worried to be honest. Anyway, we go in, and there are a few other people in there about our age. We get our food and sit at a table to eat. One of the drivers comes in and sits a few booths down with his back to the wall, right where he can see us. My back is to him, but Anna gets really creeped out and wants us to leave. This guy isn't eating, nor anything at all. He's just staring at us. Again, this is a pretty crowded McDonald's in one of the nicest towns in Southern California, so I feel pretty safe. Living in South Central, you get used to the odd creep, but still Anna was freaked out, so I agree to go. I just have to run to the bathroom first. It was one of those McDonald's where the counter and the main dining room were in one big room, and then there was a sort of hallway off to the side of the counter with more seating and the bathroom at the end, way in the back. There was also a door going outside right next to the bathrooms. The bathroom has only two stalls. I just walked into the first stall, not really paying attention to whether or not anyone else was in there. So I'm in there doing my thing, and then I hear the door open, and I hear Anna call my name. At this point, I'm very confused since she's supposed to be watching our stuff, and I'm like, yeah, what's up? She asks, are you okay? Yeah, just peeing, I reply. She was like, oh, okay and just stands there in the doorway. After a second, I hear her leave, and I'm thinking, that's really weird. So I walk out of the bathroom and see her waiting by the door with all of her stuff in her hands. I ask her what's going on and why she came into the bathroom, and she just looks at me really panicky and is like, we need to leave right now. At this point, I'm still not afraid. I'm just sort of confused. Anyway, we rush out to the car and she starts telling me what exactly happened. Turns out when I walked into the bathroom, 
The creepy driver followed me in a little while after. I don't remember hearing him come in, but maybe I did and just assumed someone had either been in the stall next to me and was leaving, or had just come to check their makeup or something. I'll be honest, I really wasn't paying attention. I know for sure I wasn't aware that anyone had entered the stall next to me because he didn't close the stall door when he came in. She was on her phone, so she didn't see him follow me either. A young guy noticed it and went up to my friend, asking if we knew the driver. Frantic, she told him we did not and ran to check up on me. He was in the stall next to me with the stall door open. It was the large handicapped stall and he's not making a sound. She came in and didn't see him, so she called my name to make sure I was still alive, and he rushed out of the stall past her. She was in shock and didn't know what to do, other than gather our things and prepare to run. When we went to her car, he was sitting in his big black car with tinted windows next to us, still staring. We ended up speeding off, and when I got the story, we called the McDonald's to let them know what happened, but they didn't really care. And then we called the non-emergency sheriff line to report it as well, which was closed. Thank you, Malibu, for absolutely nothing. Eventually, my mom went full-on mama bear mode and threatened to blast it all over social media that they didn't take my report seriously, and they got a hold of someone at corporate from there. They checked their cameras, and they saw the guy that followed me in. A police report was made, so hopefully this never happens to anyone else again. Thank God nothing happened, but it was really scary. The guy was sitting in his car staring at us when we left. Who knows what he was planning on doing? So guy in the McDonald's bathroom. Let's not meet ever again. Edit. There is a letter that corporate sent to the OP of this story, which you can find by searching OP's username and the story name on our Let's Not Meet, and you can see it for yourself. Edit 2. A family friend who used to be a cop told us that this isn't all that uncommon. A lot of the time, they just film the girl in the stall, which is obviously creepy, but not violent. But in this case, the red flag is that he didn't close his stall door, and I never saw anything, which made us think he was waiting to catch me off guard when I turned to wash my hands. Scary no matter what. Always be aware of your surroundings, and trust your gut, or in my case, your friend's gut. It's been months since this happened, but it was on my mind today and I can't believe I didn't post it sooner to this subreddit. Back in the winter, I had returned home to New York City and I was getting used to the usual routine on the subway to get to and from work and around the city in general. I hate the subway as an overarching sentiment towards the MTA. I had always called it the bane of my existence because it challenged me in all the areas I am sensitive about close proximity to strangers, claustrophobic spaces, temperature extremes, mysteriously foul smells, pests, and vermin. Overall, it's convenient and tolerable on a good day, but I still had my fair share of unfortunate encounters over the years, which led me to regard the subway as a less than ideal mode of transportation around the city. This one early evening on a Sunday solidified my overall thinking of the subway. I had just left a breast cancer fundraiser event around 7pm and I was only going a few stops over to where my house was on the end train. My little sister and I sat chatting quietly as the train began to move. A medium build African American man with a grey pea coat and a beanie on made eye contact with me and hurried on over. He bent down close to my face, extending his arm out for a handshake, and said, Hello there, you are very beautiful. How are you doing? What's your name? I sort of just recoiled back, giving him a confused, 
What are you doing in my personal space? That kind of look, shaking my head in clear disinterest to make his acquaintance. All of a sudden, it was like a switch flipped, and his previously sweet tone turned into an ugly sort of rage. Stupid bitch, think you're better than everybody? You ain't shit, you ugly bitch, clown ass bitch, the hell out of here clown. He screamed at the top of his lungs, and I noticed everyone around turning and staring in our direction. Screw you anyway. He made a waving off gesture while I kinda just sat there staring at him wide eyed, wondering what he was going to do next. His entire stance was very aggressive. He then stopped screaming, and to my surprise made a direct pass to try the same exact thing on my sister, who mind you was right next to me. Wow, you are beautiful too, can I shake your hand? He then reached directly next to me to touch her. The nerve. I extended my arm and said firmly, Hey, leave my sister alone and back out of our personal space. This guy smacks my hand out of the way. Now he's fully pushed my buttons. I stand up and realize I'm about eye level with him, so he must have been around 5 foot 9, maybe 5 foot 11 at most. Don't touch my sister, I said, and I was officially heated. This next part is a blur, as I don't remember what he said when he pushed me, and then we began to scuffle, but I landed a very sweet uppercut on his jaw. This enraged him, and he had me on my back within seconds, kicking me, and screaming, I will frickin' kill you. After what felt like an eternity, two good people of the subway had ran up behind him, and grabbed him off of me. I heard one guy say, Leave her alone, dude. What the hell? And when I looked up, I saw several horrified passengers staring at us as we had engaged in a full-on brawl. Adrenaline was pumping through my veins, so everything was bright, and my vision was pinpoint, and I felt numb. But the conductor said something over the speakers about holding the train at the platform, and I stood there shaking as the guys threw him onto the platform and made a barrier between the platform and the door as he attempted to get back into the car, clawing at the air and sputtering and cursing at me, staring me dead in the eye. The subway doors finally closed, locking him out. He pounded on the doors, as though possessed by a demon, screaming so loud you could see the veins in his neck as he pounded on the glass. His eyes were so bloodshot that they almost glowed red, and his voice is so loud it pierced through the entire car. I will kill you. Then the subway car pulled away from the station. Someone pointed to the ground. He had dropped his cell phone in the altercation, and it was unlocked. I found out everything I could about this crazed stranger. His name, his social media handles, saw all his selfies. The fact he had been trying very hard and was unsuccessful at getting laid. His text messages revealed he was a drug dealer of some sort. I suspected crack because of the prices, increments, and wording of the text messages, which would kind of also explain his violent outburst. I had seen my fair share of crazy in New York City, but it hadn't gotten this up close and personal in years. I was shook and emotional following the attack to say the least. I went to the police station with my aunt and uncle soon after, and I was filing a report when one of the cops at the station says, if it turns out that you stole this phone from this guy, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Dead ass, straight to my face, he implies that I stole this phone from a complete stranger on the subway and was now spinning some elaborate web that included turning myself into the police station. Mind you, when I was filing a report of an assault, I wasn't wrong in thinking that the guy wasn't going to be much help, but I digress. I gave them his full name, and they said they had a lot of people in the system with the same name. I said, well, I have all this specific information I got off the phone, 
They said they couldn't use anything off the phone without a warrant. They ended up taking his cell phone from me, and nothing ever really came of it, except of course for the ginormous bruise I had from getting a blunt kick to the thigh. An officer came by my house a few months later, and he arrived with some photos of extremely similar looking African American men, none of them mind you which I could confidently identify as my assailant. I haven't heard a single thing since I filed the report, and I couldn't find the guy on social media again. So, this lunatic is out there, most likely riding the subway somewhere, and he's waiting for the next girl to reject a handshake to, so he can go absolutely batshit crazy. Sometimes I wonder what would have happened had it been late at night with nobody around to help me. That guy was screaming that he was going to kill me, and I'm sure he would have, given the chance. Anyway, Brawling Subway Casanova. Let's not meet again. I, 22-year-old female, used to door dash on the side for some extra cash. This was in the summer of 2018, when it was a little bit newer, at least in my town it was. Since then, I think they've made a lot of changes, but at the time, it was a little unorganized. If you don't know what DoorDash is, it's like a food delivery service, typically for restaurants that don't deliver. Think of McDonald's, for example. Anyway, the one night I was doing deliveries all day, I decided to do my last delivery around 10pm, so I get an order in and the person wants a medium cheese and pepperoni pizza and loaded potato wedges from a pizzeria nearby. I was kinda wondering why they'd order from a pizzeria that delivers, but I figure it's because this place was notorious for taking forever when you order for a delivery, so I accepted the order and headed to the pizzeria. I got there and picked up the pizza confirmed on the app that I picked everything up and I was on my way. The app notified me of the special instructions that the customer asked for, which was to call them when I was outside. Okay, nothing unusual there. Lots of people ask so they can come out to me instead. I get to their address and it's downtown. It's a larger apartment building and it's completely pitch black and I instantly get an eerie feeling. So I pull to the curb, stay in the car, hell no I wasn't about to go near that building, and I call the number. Luckily DoorDash has this thing that hides your actual phone number. It rings a couple of times, and then this really creepy woman's voice comes on the line and says, We can't get to the phone right now. We're a little tied up. And then creepily giggles, meanwhile the entire time in the background, there is another woman screaming, and I mean screaming for help and for her life as well. It even got louder, as if the creepy woman was purposely putting the screaming woman on the phone. I instantly hung up, and I drove off real quick, not even knowing which direction to go. Luckily there was super popular restaurants a couple of blocks away, and I pulled into the parking lot and pulled up the app. I was worried about getting in trouble for not being able to deliver the order, so I contacted DoorDash Help Center, and they told me I had to wait 15 minutes to see if they call me or message me about their food. Well, they never called, and thank God for that. I'm sitting there in the parking lot of the restaurant, telling my mom about it, and we agree that it is most likely a prank, but that just in case it isn't, I need to call the police. So I called the non-emergency number and I tell them everything that happened. The police tell me they're going to do a wellness check and actually thanked me for calling them to tell them about it. I went home and nothing ever came of it, but I still think about it from time to time. I did get a free pizza, as well as potato wedges though, so I guess that was sort of cool. So creepy lady in the apartment let's not meet, and to the lady screaming, I hope you're safe, and I hope you're okay. It's me again. 
I posted a story yesterday, and in the comments, some nice people encouraged me to share more of the myriad of creepy experiences I've had in my life so far. As of yesterday, I spent some time with my mother, and we ended up talking about these. The one I am about to tell you is something that we still wonder about. In the summer of 1995, I was 11 years old. I was sleeping late home alone around 10 to 11 a.m. while my parents were at work. I got woken up by the doorbell, so instinctively I hurried up down the corridor. But before I rushed to open the door, as I normally would, I remembered the many times my mom scolded me for opening the door without asking who it was first or looking through the spy hole to make sure it was safe to open, especially after some previous creepy experiences have already taken place at this point. I ended up asking, who is it? But all I heard was some unintelligible mumble, so I brought a chair and stepped on it to look through the hole. We lived in an apartment building, and on the right of our door was the elevator, and then the staircase. Since the staircase windows were on the far left corner, there was not enough natural light to help me see who it was. I just saw a male with some colorful t-shirt standing outside. I repeated the question and then strained to hear the answer. He said he was looking for my mother's maiden surname and I said she was at work. To give you some context, both of my parents are doctors and I don't know if that sounds weird for the US or the rest of the Western world, but in Eastern Europe in the 90s, it wasn't uncommon for grateful patients to sometimes stop by wanting to give thanks by bringing fresh fruit or vegetables, produce from their gardens, especially those which my parents have helped but they couldn't pay. So the man said he was bringing something for my mother, except even in the murky light, I could see his hands were empty. I asked where was it? And he said he left the package at the stairs. At this point, I'm starting to get this uneasy feeling that something is not right. So I decide to be cautious and lie to him that I don't have keys. I said my parents are at work and they have told me not to open the door to strangers. So when they come back, they can help him. He started to get agitated. And then he said he can't wait this long. And then says that he is actually bringing meat so it would get spoiled in the heat if it is left outside. I start to hesitate because I'm thinking, what if he is telling the truth? Will I get in trouble for letting the meat spoil? But then I look through the spy hole again and I see his hair, which means he has his ear pressed at the door and he's listening in. That spooked me and I said, sorry, I can't help you. Please go away and come back later when I'm not alone. He once again says that he doesn't have time to go back and forth, so he offers to leave and says he will leave the package at the stairs, so when he is gone, I will not be afraid to open the door and retrieve it myself. I keep quiet and intently observe him as he goes down the stairs and makes noise of climbing down, and then I freeze, because in the silence that ensued, I was just about to really open the door and check. And that's when I saw part of his friggin' t-shirt sleeve behind the corner of the stairs. He was hiding there, most likely hoping I would open the door, thinking he was gone. When in fact, he was pressing to. What? Pounce on me? Break into our apartment? I got scared. I froze and just kept on watching, standing on the chair behind the door. And finally, after what seemed like hours, but was probably maybe 10 minutes, I heard him really descending down the stairs. I didn't open the door. I called my mom's hospital, but she couldn't put me through. So I waited for them to come back home in the afternoon. They were both worried, but proud that this time I finally did the right thing. A few hours later, all the kids from the building and I are at the little square playground slash bench area in front of it. It was buzzing with children running around, grandparents etc. So it was completely safe. My best friend Nina and I were sitting on one of the benches when all of a sudden a strange man approaches us and stands next to the bench. He asks, are you? He says my name and I hesitantly confirm. 
Although my heart starts to beat faster as I recognize the voice, it's the same man from the morning. This time, however, I'm not alone, so I instinctively press myself closer to Nina, and that's when he says, Well, I'm bringing something for, insert my father's name, but it's in the car and I have it parked there on the street. Come with me to help me bring it. Encouraged by my friend's presence and all the people around, I say to him that actually, my dad is home, so if he waits there, I will go get him, and he could help him bring whatever he has from the car, as I am little and can't carry heavy stuff. The moment I said it, the guy got quiet and then quickly started walking away. Not running, mind you, just very quickly walking. My friend, who already knew about what happened this morning, and myself ran to my apartment. I told my dad. He ran in his shorts to chase after the guy, but of course there was no trace left of him. My dad started asking away then, as once again something typical for Eastern European countries. The grandma is sitting on balconies and benches, looking at everyone and everything that's going on. Sort of like a live security system. Nobody has noticed anything except one grandma, an old lady living alone at the first floor, who says that a guy approached her earlier while she was sitting on her balcony and started asking her about our family, then tried to ask her for money to pay for the meat that he was bringing. The man told her that my parents have purchased it from him. She told him she has no money herself, but stupidly gave him a lot of information, such as my name. We never heard anything about the guy, Thank God, but those questions are still puzzling to me. What did he want? Why did he first say my mom's name, but then said he was bringing something for my dad? Was he actually focused on me? Would I have been abducted by him? Whatever the answer is, I hope I never meet him again. Edit. I now remembered that when school started after that summer, there was another situation that seemed weird and possibly dangerous, and now that I'm reading your comments, it makes me think maybe they are connected somehow. I was just coming back from school, and I saw my friends gathered in front of the apartment building, but in the entrance furthest away from the one I lived in. I was talking to them when I heard my mom calling to me. I turned and saw she was headed to work going towards the bus stop, but she called me to go to her, and when I did, she told me that she wants me to immediately go back home. I grumbled, but obliged. So from my point of view, what happened was this. I reach our entrance of the building, and I open the door, and that's when I feel somebody coming close behind me. But I don't turn and think nothing of it. Then I start climbing the stairs quickly, because I was afraid to take the elevator alone but I hear that there are equally quick footsteps following me up the stairs, and just when I was fiddling with my keys about to unlock the door, I hear my mom's extremely worried voice shouting my name from downstairs, which startled me. But then the footsteps stopped right before the person reached my floor, and they started descending back. And then my mom climbs to our floor and hugs me, and then we lock the door, then she tells me what actually happened. This is my mom's point of view. She is going to work, but sees me talking to my friends. Then she looks around and sees a creepy looking man standing nearby us and staring at us kids while we are all oblivious to his presence. So she calls my name and tells me to immediately go home. She turns and starts for the bus stop once I head home. But then an impending sense of dread consumes her, and she turns to look back, seeing that the guy is no longer where he was, but he's actually following me. And the moment she turns, she actually sees how I enter the building, and he disappears a few seconds behind me. My mom starts running in sheer panic, then reaches the entrance and shouts my name, and then she hears his footsteps back down, and when he reaches the ground floor, he passes her by, but my mom said he gave her such an evil, menacing glare, as if he wanted to strangle her for preventing his intentions or something. 
She said alarm bells rang in her head, and her whole body was full of adrenaline, ready to fight if she must, because she felt I was in real danger. Damn, the more I post about those things, the more details that I start to remember. Do you guys think it was the same guy? I didn't get to see him, mind you, and my mom doesn't know what the guy from before looked like, so who really knows? This just happened tonight, so this shit is still fresh in my mind, and I'm freaked out too, and honestly, I'm even a little bit pissed off. I, 23-year-old female, met Jason, 29-year-old male, from an app online last September. We clicked immediately, and from then on went out together about once a week, sometimes even twice. We spent the past year going on dates, out to nice restaurants, garden walks, spending the night, etc. We established that we had feelings for each other about two months into everything, though we had our rocky moments and I didn't fully trust him at all. At one point, I wanted to date him, but he claimed he was way too busy with work, which of course caused us to separate for a little while. Once we eventually came back together, I told him I didn't want to be exclusive but we could still hang out, as I did enjoy his company. Now, there was always some sneaking suspicions that there was another partner in his life, because he always paid in cash wherever we went, and was very secretive about his private life. I had voiced these thoughts to him, but honestly didn't care too much, because after he told me he wasn't interested in dating me, I also started seeing another partner, and was using protection with both of them. Meanwhile, he didn't want to date me, but raged whenever he thought there was another man around my life. He has exhibited some concerning, as well as possessive behaviors, but I let them slide for the most part, because I was still doing whatever I wanted to do. Fast forward to tonight, November 19th, 2019, 14 months after we met. We went to a really nice restaurant downtown after work and I asked if he wanted to take the subway back to my place since we had a few drinks. We stopped by his car to grab his bag and off we went to the station. When we got to the station, he said he forgot his card in his car and I figured it was no biggie and swiped for him instead. I said he didn't need to pay me back because it was like $2 but he insisted that he would Venmo me. When we got to my apartment, I told him he was welcome to take a shower, and he went to the bathroom. I was messing around on my phone, and I saw CS had sent me $2 for the train. This was weird to me because his initials are JN, so I clicked on his Venmo friends list. He only had around 20 Venmo friends, so I picked a random person and looked them up on Facebook. I went down their friends list, and would you look at that, a picture of Jason and his brother. The only issue is the name was Chase Smith. The photo did look a little different, because he was about 50 to 60 pounds heavier in the photograph, and is currently very fit, but I was 90% sure it was him. Just to confirm, I googled his name and the area around which he lives, and I got a hit on white pages. It said he was related to Velma and Shaggy Smith, and I remembered him telling me that his siblings were named Velma and Shaggy. So it turned out I don't even know the name of the guy that I've been boinking for a year. He got out of the shower and sat down on my bed. I was quiet and looked at his face, asking him, is your real name Chase Smith? This guy looked me dead in the eye and said, no. You guys, I lost it when he said that. Like I made the leave Britney alone guy look calm and collected. I started crying and telling him to get the hell out of my house. He approached me and I told him not to touch me, but he grabbed my wrists and insisted that we have a talk about it. I told him again to get the hell out of my house and to never contact me again. He refused to leave for a while, but he eventually did. Afterward, I looked a little deeper, and I found out he has criminal records, 
though I can't see what they're for. From his past behavior, I'm honestly a little worried for my safety because I immediately blocked him on everything and I know for a fact he's gonna go apeshit when he realizes that he can't contact me at all. Everything has just been a straight up lie and when you think you know someone, it turns out they're probably crazy. Admittedly, it is a little bit funny because, you know, what the hell. But also, I'm getting some you vibes and I'm not ready to die yet, you know? So I'd be cool if Chase Smith never came around again. Update. So my sister has continued the sleuth. Turns out today he slightly changed the spelling of his last name on Facebook, most likely to deter others he's been messing with from finding his profile. He doesn't know how I found him and doesn't realize that that spelling of his last name wasn't relevant in the process. The dude is an actual psycho who is most likely doing this to multiple women. I'm honestly more afraid for them than myself because they clearly don't know what's going on if he's taking further steps to hide himself. I wish I knew who they were so that I could honestly reach out and warn them of this maniac. Hello, everyone. For context, I'm a girl, and I grew up on Long Island, the suburbs of New York City. It was as small of a town as you can get in that context, so while there were thousands of people, and you saw strangers every day, you ran into people you knew just as regularly. Tabitha was my best friend during my teenage years. We were a week apart in age. We went to the same high school, lived a block apart, had sleepovers all the time, and were practically inseparable, etc. Tabitha was also unfortunately a bit of a stereotypical blonde. While she wasn't stupid per se, she wasn't the tartest Mentos in the tube. She once asked, who's he, when asked about the National Guard for example, stuff like that. She usually laughed at herself as much as anyone else. My dad was always involved in the local town government and such, which meant he helped organize the yearly flea market, which we all enjoyed. For me, my brother, and our friends, we got to feel important by handing out official Civic Society TM signs. For the rest of the people in the town, they got to conceivably make money off their old crap. Except... For Larry, of course, who never sold anything at all. Larry was perpetually mid-forties, balding, and sleazy. He dressed like it was 1973, and he had the same stuff to sell every year. Cassette tapes ten years out of date, which he, a lame pudgy white guy, would try to hawk using awkward slang to our extremely African-American and Latino community. There was also cheap costume jewelry and the like. In fact, the only reason I remember his name is because every single year he tried to sell this blinged out keychain that read out Larry. Shockingly, it never sold. He was always trying to integrate himself to my dad too because my dad was like slightly important. I guess that was by running the flea market. That was according to Larry, yes. Of course, he was a joke to everyone, especially us kids. We usually just spent all flea market day teasing him and pretending to be interested in his tacky crap to get him to go into his hilarious used car-esque sales pitch. But then I remember one year after the flea market, my dad took me aside. He told me that if Larry ever tried to get me alone or said something that made me feel weird or touched me, that I should tell him right away. I was a pretty streetwise Long Island kid, so I understood he was insinuating that Larry was, or might have been a creep in some sort of sexual way. Apparently other adults knew and suspected this too, because I noticed they never left us alone with them. This was before the internet made his sex offender registries public, so I never knew what the details exactly were. But in either case, word quickly spread among us kids that Larry was creepy as all hell. Anyway, 
Fast forward some years later, Tabitha and I are both around 13 years old, freshman year of high school. Typically after school, we'd walk down to the town's main street, Beach Avenue, where there was a CVS, pizza place, Chinese food restaurant, etc. Whereupon we would blow our allowance gossiping over snacks, the usual teenage routine. And Larry, by this time, had taken to walking this self-same street with his cardboard box full of crisscross cassettes as he was trying his sales pitch on whichever poor sucker he could corner. Maybe he thought the flea market was limiting him, but I'm not too sure. The point was that he was lurking out there, still tacky as ever. We all found creative ways to avoid him, though by this time it was rare we ever got caught. Maybe once a year. Anyway, so this particular incident happened on a Saturday. I wake up to a call from Tabitha, who sounds breathless and impatient on the phone. It turns out she had a nightmare that we'd gone to the pizza place on Beach Avenue, where Larry had turned up, cornered her, and raped her. Jesus Christ, I say. Yeah, she says. So you want to get some Chinese food then? The Chinese food place is literally right next to the pizza place on Beach Avenue. Um, I reply. She explains that in her dream, it was the pizza place where the violent rape happened, not the Chinese place, so it's silly to be afraid. Um, okay, but whatever. I wasn't the one assaulted in her dream, and I'm pretty hungry. We meet up and walk the two blocks to the Sechon Garden, the best Chinese food on the East Coast, and I'll hear no arguments. And we order a couple of egg rolls, then talk about the gossip as girls normally do. We're having a great time, and that's when Larry shows up. I'm sitting on the side of the table that faces the window, so I'm the first to notice him across the street, pacing with his cassettes and trying in vain to find a prospective buyer. I chose not to tell Tabitha this, however both because she's prone to be a bit hysterical and because I'm kind of at a loss for words myself. It's been probably a year and a half since either of us had seen this guy, and now, the night after Tabitha's prophecy-induced dream, here he is. But it's too late, because he's seen us from across the street, and he's headed this way. Tabitha doesn't notice my silence until the bell over the Chinese place dings. Hey, Larry slides into the empty seat next to Tabitha, his arm resting casually by her head almost around her shoulders. He starts into this sleazy sweet talk routine, seemingly unaware of Tabitha's frozen, terrified silence and my slack-jawed shock. So, what grade are you girls in? He starts to say, but Tabitha interrupts him by climbing literally on top of her chair, her hands spread to either side like a traffic cop. She's still refusing to look at him when she shrieks, you need to get away from me. Everyone's staring at her. Me, Larry, the Chinese food guys behind the counter. Right now, she screams at the top of her lungs, and Larry leaps to his feet, his box of cassettes clattering on the floor. I didn't do anything, he yells. I didn't touch you. You saw. He turns to me, the daughter of the town's flea market organizer. You know, the one with the connections. I didn't touch her. I didn't touch her. I stare at him and Tabitha, who's still standing on her chair by the way, and I'm dumbly staring, my mouth full of egg roll. I didn't touch anyone, he yells, gathering up his cassettes and fleeing. Now maybe I'm misjudging Larry. Maybe he was a perfectly harmless creepy asshole and his telling reaction to Tabitha's hysteria was just a coincidence. All I know is that I never really learned what his history was, and that none of us ever saw Larry ever again in that big ass town. TLDR. My ditzy friend had a Joanne of Arc dream, tempted fate like an idiot, and ran a probable molester out of town. Never in my then short life had I ever really considered the concept of actual fear. I loved horror movies, 
My father was constantly renting them for me, despite my mother's protest. I loved that sort of fear. The tingle in your stomach when the music starts to get tense, and the character in the movie does not see something behind them, and you're anxiously awaiting the climax of the sudden jump. That is a fun fear. What I felt that autumn night, when I was 8 years old, was much, much different. I grew up north of Toronto, in a really beautiful town. We had a gorgeous, big two-story house that even now, 17 years later, I still consider home in a strange way. It certainly was not a small town by any means. It wasn't the sort of place that everyone knew each other and no one locked their doors. In general though, it was safe. There was the occasional stranger danger stories that would circulate about kids seeing someone in the forest or ravine areas that surrounded parts of the town. Being a family of all girls, we were taught the basics, such as always locking the doors, never talking to strangers, never accepting rides, etc. Anyway, it was the beginning of fall, where the maple tree leaves started to turn amazing reds and oranges, and it would get dark much earlier. It was around 8 o'clock, and the sun had already fully set. My parents and oldest sister were all out, leaving my middle sister, Kay, and I home alone. Kay decides she wants to have a friend over, and wants us to walk and meet her halfway. It was realistically only about a 5 minute walk to get there, although at the time it seemed like a huge adventure. Kay could not find her house key. We searched and searched for it, and no luck. While she continued searching, I remembered my parents kept a key hidden in the garage for emergencies. In this particular house, there was no door directly connecting the garage to the house. You had to open the actual garage door to get to it, or of course there was a side regular door as well. Since I had no key, I opened the garage door. I remember very clearly finding the key, and as I got back to the keypad to close the door, I saw headlights. I anticipated seeing a familiar vehicle, seeing my parents or my sister arriving home, but that is not what I was met with. Pulled halfway up my driveway, about 10 feet from where I was standing, was a beige Montana minivan. I heard the slight sound of a window rolling down and a car door opening. My eyes finally focused on the figure of a man, one arm fully out the window, along with his torso and head. He held the door ajar too, easier access to jumping out if he decided to do so. He was a big man, completely bald, like the shaved down to the skin type, skinny head sort of bald too, and he had a thick sole patch on his chin. It was probably only a few seconds, but it felt like an eternity until he finally spoke up. I remember there was this lightness to his voice. I think at the time I probably took it as a friendly tone, but as an adult now, I wonder if it wasn't a more sickening excitement that he may have felt at the opportunity that he saw me. Are you home alone? This is the fear I was talking about. A muscle stiffening, stomach churning fear. This is the sort of fear you see in horror movies where the person is too afraid to move. That physically freezing fear is what I felt. I was 8 years old and tiny. I had no chance at all. The garage was empty. The driveway was empty too. No cars and no signs of any adults. No hope. It felt like I was outside of my body watching this happen to another girl. It wasn't happening to me. I couldn't be kidnapped or hurt. That sort of stuff doesn't actually happen. I heard this weird echoing noise come from somewhere, my body still frozen, and it wasn't until he was hurling himself back into his vehicle and squealing his tires as he violently reversed off my driveway that I realized my sister had opened the front door. I assume he didn't want to take a chance of who could have been opening the door, so that's why he took off. My parents eventually came home, and the police came, and we filed our report. Nothing came of it, 
no man was ever found, and the stories raged on in our neighborhood of the occasional other creepy encounter that other kids have had, and there's no idea what may have happened had my sister not come to the door at that very moment. I try not to think about it too much. I try not to imagine what a grown man in a minivan could have done to a tiny eight-year-old girl. Now I know some people hate the whole let's not meet ending, but hey, when in Rome, I hope I never, ever meet the man I saw that night again, and I hope to God no other little girl does either. So my boyfriend and I have been dating for, geez, I think three years now or so. He's an awesome guy, and from the second I met him, he'd done so much for me. Talking to him gave me the courage to leave a temporary, yet horrible situation with another guy who took advantage of me when I was having troubles with abandonment issues. That's a totally different story. That's not acceptable for this subreddit though. My boyfriend had this female friend who he thought of as his sister, and he was both excited and worried about the two of us actually meeting, since he and I are very long distance. He lives in Wales, I live in America, and we'd be meeting via an online game that the three of us play together. The friend and I immediately hit it off, or so I thought. At first, she was great. She and I talked about a lot and had some stuff in common as well, mainly lots of anxiety and a fondness of my boyfriend. Bear in mind he and I weren't dating yet. We were just friends, and he'd already introduced me to the rest of his friend group in the game and in his real life, all of whom I'm still very close to, minus a few of them of course. The first sign of something being off came when, one evening, his friend started to lament to me that my boyfriend never played games with her. She was acting like it was my fault, saying things like, he only plays with you, and since you joined, he never does anything with me anymore. It was weird because I told my boyfriend since we met that I never wanted him to choose me over friends, and I knew how highly he talked about this girl, so I did what I thought was right at the time and offered to tell him he should play with her more. Like I'd have any control over him, right? Whatever. Over the course of about six months, more cracks started to appear in her facade. When I announced that he and I were dating, she told me she didn't believe I liked him, and that you can like someone, but not really like like them. She and a friend she had started to put pressure on me to get him to play more too, they were always telling me I needed to get him to come on, but I needed him to level up in the class that he was playing, but they never went to him. Eventually, I broke down crying because of a week-long tirade of them telling me to get him on, even after me saying that I couldn't just force him to play. Shortly into our relationship, he and I got into a fight. My boyfriend, bless his heart, worries about me because I've never been a big eater. When we first met, I'd eat nothing but a bag of popcorn for a meal, and he would beg me to eat more. At one point, he told me he hadn't eaten much for a few days, and it worried me, so I lost my temper with him, which started the fight. He vented to his friend, and she came to me, belittling my concern, and ultimately putting me into such a fit of anxiety that one of my boyfriend's friends had to stay talking to me in order to keep me from doing something to myself. Her words to me were full of accusations that I didn't care about my boyfriend's feelings, that it was my job as a woman to tell my boyfriend my thoughts, but not to have him tell me his, because guys don't think that if I really cared about him, I'd be there for him, that I was throwing away the relationship he and I had, and trashing on how open he'd been with me. I later went to my boyfriend and told him what happened, but when he asked to see her text messages to me, he returned and told me that she had been just trying to help and I'd been overreacting. Last year, I broke down after finding the messages and sent them to him myself because he wanted to help me process the subject. It still causes me a lot of anxiety. 
Turns out she'd only shown him about 20% of the actual conversation because on Facebook, you can delete messages, but only client side. Sorry, friend, I still had all of them. He was horrified to say the least, realizing what had actually happened, and he felt terrible about it. Shortly after the original messages, a few more things happened. I'll simplify most of them really quickly. She tried to get me to steal from our mutual group of gaming friends, got one of my friends so riled up that she left said group, but I'm still friends with her. Getting my boyfriend and I to fight over dumb things, to the point of getting him to question why he bothered with me, and me to become so paranoid that he was going to leave me, and continuously belittled my feelings, slash anxiety, all while playing the victim and overplaying her own anxiety to get attention. All of this, on top of lies after lies after lies, finally boiled into a series of events that ended my boyfriend's friendship with her. She and a few others planned a surprise for me, because of things going on from the fallout of the situation that I'd been in when I'd originally met my boyfriend, doubled with the fact that I was well beyond so done level with the girl. My boyfriend heard me scream in anger and frustration for the first time during all of this, and I wasn't really in the right headspace at all. I reluctantly accepted the invitation and went through with it, but left immediately after it was done without saying a word to anyone. I then proceeded to get the girl and her friend, the same one who'd harassed me about getting my boyfriend on in the past, pestering me and accusing me of being ungrateful, rude, selfish, and uncaring. The same day, the leader of the guild, my boyfriend, the girl, the girl's friend, my mutual friends, and myself are all part of, gave me a special treat. He let me go off on the girl, calling her out on everything she did and put me through, and how she was lying to everyone, and how she was trying to play everyone a fool. However, it didn't end there because she continued to harass me. In game, she would spam emotes, write a mount she knew I wanted but couldn't get, and even accused me at one point of leaving a group chat simply because I lost invite privileges that I never used anyway. She took every opportunity to openly harass me, or to even put me down, until it finally built up enough that I messaged the leader, informing him that I was planning on leaving the guild because I didn't feel like I belonged anymore. The guild leader asked me to stay, and a few days later, he presented me with a question. If I kick her from the guild, Will you leave? My answer to him was, no. That day, she was asked to leave. While I apologized to the guild leader for making him do this, she apologized for my boyfriend, myself, and a friend making him do it. He openly admitted afterwards that he could see who was lying to him just based on our responses to him. I'd be apologetic and admitted my part, and she blamed others. She then proceeded to text my boyfriend and tell him I was a bunch of different nasty things. Tell my boyfriend's mother that I like to stir the pot. No, hon, that's you, and literally everyone knows it, especially his mother, who adores me, and later even forced one of her ex-boyfriends to quit D&D because I was in the group after she left, and my boyfriend wouldn't let her rejoin because he knew it would trigger an anxiety attack for me. She also proceeded to stop a few former mutual friends from joining any guild and game that I was in, specifically if I was in it, and tried recently to make up with my boyfriend twice, at which point she lied about our mutual friends, as well as guild mates. Horribly, might I add. I'd suggest that if you're going to lie, keep track of your stories, and don't lie about things that are obviously false. To this day, she's still creeping on us. She recently bumped into my boyfriend while he was at work and gave him a panic attack. He told his mother what happened, and now the girl's banned from their house. Last year on my birthday, she sent me a message wishing me a happy birthday and wishing he and I a happy anniversary since we started dating on my birthday even making it a point to say to my boyfriend 
that she remembers that sort of thing. So to the girl who used to be my boyfriend's friend, who manipulated he and I to the point of nearly getting me to self-harm, or worse, who to this day continues to creep on he and I, who tried to break us up and get his mother to hate me, let's not meet again. This is my first time submitting a story, so please bear with me. I used to work at a well-known bank as a banker. The banker is not a manager, but oversees the tellers when there isn't another manager. I was the closing supervisor, so I was the last to leave the bank most evenings. Part of my job duties were to open new accounts and to answer questions for customers. I had gone to work and my first customer of the day was already waiting. He was a young guy, maybe early 20s, and he was around my age. I brought him to my desk and began making small talk and opening his account. I remember he had a heavy accent, and his English was good enough, but not completely fluent. I continued to be friendly, as I am to all my customers, and I remember he asked a lot of questions. It probably took me 45 minutes to get his accounts all set up. While I was filling in his information, I noticed he worked at the grocery store very close to my bank. It was the same store I would often visit on my lunch because they have a deli that made great sandwiches. Anyway, I finished with his transactions and I wished him a good day. I continued on with other customers and about two hours later, my phone rang. It was a call for me that was transferred from the main branch line. I answered the phone, and it was the young man who was there a couple of hours ago. We're going to call him Miguel. He asked me a simple question about his account, which I answered, and again I bid him a good day. Throughout this day, Miguel would call another four times, every time with simple questions. I was getting a little bit annoyed, but I continued to be kind and patient with him, thinking it could just be a language issue. The following day, I went into work, and I had a couple of messages from him left with my coworker. At this point, I was a bit weirded out, but still didn't think too much about it. I did however decide to stop going to that grocery store as a precaution, since I thought his behavior was kind of off. That night when I went to my car to leave, there was a note on my windshield. I took it off and looked at it before getting in my car. It didn't say anything. It was just a drawing of cartoon characters doing explicit things. I was disgusted, but not afraid, and I went home. Over the following two weeks, this Miguel guy would continue to call me, and I was still receiving these drawings on my car a few times. I started to park my car in the view of the cameras that were supposed to be for customers because I didn't want to have to walk too far by myself. Our parking was behind the building and out of street view. Anyway, my manager finally got tired of this guy constantly calling and told him to stop calling or he would close his accounts and ban him from the bank. I hadn't told anyone about the notes because I was a bit shy being that they were of a sexual nature. But once my manager yelled at him, the calls ended up stopping, but I was still receiving those strange notes. They were starting to become more threatening however. They talked about sexual assault and the things he will force me to do as well as the drawings of what he was saying. I finally asked my assistant manager if she could talk to the tellers that closed with me. Most of the time, they were male, and to also ask them to wait and to walk out to my car with me. She definitely understood and started scheduling them to get off at the same time as me. We only had a few male tellers, three actually, so they would take turns walking me to my car. After a couple of months, the notes ended up stopping. This was around the time one of the tellers had gotten fired for stealing. I found out later from one of the other male tellers that the notes were not from Miguel at all. They were being left there for me from the tellers who were walking me to my car. The other one knew about it 
and said nothing. Guys whom I was alone in the branch with for several times a week. I don't know if he meant to do those things and didn't get a chance because he was fired or if he was trying to just scare me and I don't know if the other one just knew about it or was in on it but I definitely was more aware about being alone at work with someone after that. Me and my ex broke up about a year ago and it also got pretty messy. I was receiving DMs, text messages, and Snapchats from what seemed like everyone from her hometown. I got everything from calling me names to even death threats as well. I ended up having to block about 10 people from three different sources of social media, but that's besides the point. The worst threats I received was from one of her recent exes, one that read, Oh, so you hurt my girl. It's over for you. I know what town you live in. I will find you, and when I do, your parents won't be able to recognize your body. He also sent me several others which explained the ways he wanted to torture me. I just ended up blocking him along with everyone else and I moved on with my life. Well today, getting close to our one year of breaking up, me and my ex have started to talk again. We're on okay terms and everything seemed fine. Anyway, I go about my day and walk over to this popular deli to grab a bite to eat and I end up passing a friend of mine along the way. They shout my name across the street and head over. We talk for a bit, and then we split ways. As I head over to the deli, this is when I was approached by three taller guys. My stomach hit the ground when I saw the guy's face. It turned out to be the ex-boyfriend that I knew instantly from having to stare at his profile picture. He had brought his friends along with him, and they found me. He then quickly grabbed my shoulder tightly and looked me dead in the eyes. I stared back into his eyes, and they seemed full of rage and insanity as well. I finally found you, he said in probably the most calm voice. He continued to whisper, You know what I have to do to you now. I am a man of my word after all. Every inch of my damn body now began to crawl. Fight or flight was kicking in and time felt on slow motion. My brain is running a million miles an hour. Three versus one. Well, okay, this isn't good, but they can't just kill me here in broad daylight. Do they have a car? Or are they going to kidnap me? First, I started to look for an exit. He then tightened his grip and said, nobody is going to save you. That's when I booked it full pedal to the metal. I knocked his grip off of me and watched as three guys try to grab me, but I was already gone and I ran as fast as I could. Thankfully, I know the area pretty well, so I took off towards the direction of my friend's apartment. They chased after me screaming full-blown battle cries. I turned the corner and by the luck of a million gods, I saw somebody was exiting my friend's apartment building, which, mind you, had a lock from the outside gate. I dashed in and slammed the gate behind me. Then I watched for about five minutes as they searched the nearby area for me, checking in and behind dumpsters. These guys were serious. I feel lucky to even be telling this event right now. This is, after all, one crazy dude, and I hope I never meet him again. Hey, thanks for watching today's episode of the Creepy Fox Scary Stories Podcast. If you did enjoy, then make sure to leave a like rating, and leave a comment down below letting me know what you all thought. Also, if you are a first-time listener joining us for the first time, and you did enjoy, then consider hitting that subscribe button and the bell beside it. As I mentioned in the intro, we do upload some of the best true crime and scary stories content that you'll hear on YouTube, so subscribe and look forward to more content. Speaking of stories, if you yourself do have a story that you'd like to submit, 
Then do send it in with the user submissions email on screen. That's tcfnarrations at gmail.com. Now I'd like to go ahead and give a very special thank you and a shout out to all my channel members. Thank you to Spunky the Nutcase, Bo, Rice and Beans, Linz, Maribel, Dread Archive, Sean, Jen, Robbie, and Susie. Thank you so much. Your support means the world, and it helps me with continuation of releasing brand new Scary Stories content and focusing more on the channel. Also, of course, thank you to the regular viewers who watch the videos, leave likes, comments, and share the videos with family and friends. Anyway, that is going to go ahead and do it for today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you all on the next episode of the Creepy Fox Podcast. Take care, and have yourself an amazing day.